all. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to this. Um, I'm, I'm just a little bit about me. I'm originally from Maine, actually. I'm originally from Burnham, Maine, <coughs> excuse me, Burnham, Maine, which is, uh, what is it? SAD 53, I don't know. Uh, Pittsfield, Burnham, MCI. I had a one, I had one of those like modified one room schoolhouses growing up in Burnham that doesn't have kids in it anymore. So, um, but I'm, I'm happy to talk to you all about this. There was a, there was a big change in the asthma guidelines. The guidelines actually came out in December, 2020, but we were a little preoccupied with other things at the time. And so it didn't really start rolling out in practice until a little bit after that. Um, the way I structured this talk is just to give you sort of a brief introduction into like what the problem was, why they felt like they needed to address something, what they did to address it. And then I have 38 slides. The talk is really only 12 or 13 slides. And then the 38 other slides is just data in case I want to show you something from another study. So, um, so we should have plenty of time for discussion um, or I can just keep on talking. So it was December, 2020 journal of allergy clinical immunology um, came up with this. This is a division of the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, which was the last guidelines that were produced. Um, and so what are the big changes? Are you seeing all these notifications over my slides or are you just seeing the slides? Just the slides. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Um, so uh, the big changes in management are the use of as needed inhaled steroids in children under age five. So most of you aren't gonna be dealing with that because they're not school age children. Uh, the use of Simbicort or Dulera as a rescue medicine instead of albuterol, that's the big one. And I don't know how often you guys are seeing that yet, but I'm happy to just kind of explore that more with you. And then the use of teotropium in children 12 and older. And, and I, I don't have a lot of slides on that, but I'm happy to talk to you about that. It's a controller medication. So you're not gonna be seeing that like as a sort of in, and it's usually given in the evening, not during the school day. So you, you're not gonna be seeing that in the school, I don't think, but I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, so why, why did they feel like there was a need for a change? Well, it turns out that daily albuterol usage leads to a decreased sensitivity of airways to albuterol. So what, what they were finding in certain populations is that they would be flying through albuterol inhalers. And when they made it to the emergency room, they didn't have anything to offer to dilate the airways. So uh, it's a real problem, as you can imagine, because when they get exacerbations, you don't have any bronchodilators left to treat them with. And they end up in the hospital for a long time or in the ICU. Um, so they had more severe exacerbations, more emergency room visits because albuterol wasn't working that great, more hospitalizations. Um, and um, this is just kind of a repeat. So before the 2020 guidelines, uh, so how do we prevent that? We basically use albuterol less frequently. Um, before the 2020 guidelines that came out, how we got kids to use it less frequently was basically daily, daily therapy. So inhaled steroids being the most effective and still the most effective medication to control asthma symptoms. Uh, that was plus or minus a long acting beta agonist, which is for motorol and salmeterol. Um, and uh, plus or minus a leukotriene receptor antagonist, which is Montelukast or Singular, right? And I, I'll, I'll use brand names too, because I don't, we don't, think of these generic names very often uh, and they're kind of designed that way. So uh, obviously I'm talking about fluticasone with inhaled steroids alone, uh, Dulera, Simbacort and Advair for the long acting beta agonist and an inhaled steroid. Um, so why not daily inhaled steroids? There's a ton of data that shows that they're safe at lower doses. There's a, a ton of data showing they're extremely successful at preventing asthma exacerbations and improving control. Um, but you know, some families just don't want their kids on daily meds or high dose daily meds, which is something that in this day and age, um, we try to meet parents where they are. And, and if they're not gonna give the meds, they're not effective. So you kind of have to figure out a way to treat them. The other thing is at higher doses, you actually can get adrenal suppression and suppression of growth. And so we, we want to prevent using high dose inhaled steroids if we don't need to, because uh, it's rare, but some of those children do have decreased linear growth. Um, well, the other thing is adherence to medication is not infrequent, as you all know, probably. Um, and so um, by giving them a, a regimen that maybe requires less therapy on a day-to-day -day basis, you might actually improve adherence if it's effective. It's no sense, there's no sense in doing that if it's not as effective as the other option. So, um, 
So what if there was a medication that was not albuterol that you could use as a rescue? And it turns out there really is one. Um, so, and that medication is Formoterol. So Formoterol is the long acting beta agonist that's in Simbicort and Dulera. Um, and what this slide shows is airway dilation. And uh, I just broke this down. It's, a, it's change in SGAL, which is specific airway conductance, but basically how much dilation you get after a dose of the medication per unit time. So the, the black squares are for motorol. And if you give an airway that's collapsed for motorol, um, if you give an airway under bronchospasm for motorol, you get 80% dilation within the first five minutes. Um, that's actually faster and, and more dilation than you get with albuterol at an effective dose and much better than you get with salmeterol, which again is an advair. So it turns out Formoterol is a long acting beta agonist, but also has a is a short acting beta, beta agonist and can be used for rescue medication. Um, you can see not only do you get more dilation more quickly, but it persists for a longer period of time than albuterol alone. So it's a pretty attractive drug. Now Formoterol doesn't exist in a formulation to give it without an inhaled steroid yet. Um, I think we'll probably end up there eventually, but, um, but this is the data that led them to start looking at Formoterol as a rescue medication. Some other data. So this is this is functional data. So this is change in FEV1 of humans. Uh, so the amount of air they get out in one second uh, versus time after dosing these drugs. So you can see here's albuterol is the diamond. So in the first 10 minutes, you get uh, a, a greater um, increase in, in the amount of air they can expel. So less bronchospasm than you do with uh, formoterol or salmeterol. So even though formoterol was more effective in increasing the airway size, functionally in humans, albuterol is a little bit more effective than formoterol, but um, essentially equivalent. It's not significantly different than formoterol and formoterol will last for a longer period of time. And we'll get that in the next graph. So meterol you can see just doesn't, isn't as effective as either one in an acute setting. Um, this uh, panel on the right is, um, so this is one hour, 60 minutes, and this is 12 hours. So you can see albuterol will take off together with formoterol. As albuterol starts to wane, formoterol keeps dilating and then slowly wears off within 12 hours. And hence the twice daily dosing regimen for uh, the use of formoterol. Salmeterol, you can see the lags behind in the bronchodilation, but also has a really long time of onset. So again, the twice daily dosing. Um, so that led to the change in guidelines that are people calling smart therapy. Um, in Europe, it's called MART therapy. They left the S off, um, which I kind of like because smart kind of, sounds kind of smarmy, um, that we're treating people the smart way. Um, I don't think that was a mistake. Um, the, um, I want to emphasize that smart therapy is for motorol, which is Simbicort and Dulera, and not Salmeterol, which is Advair. You can't use Advair as smart therapy. Um, and there's one very important reason. So I don't know if how many of you were around long enough to remember the black box warning that came out on um, long acting beta agonists. It said, don't give them in the setting an exacerbation. And that's because of this first SMART trial. So I get, that's why I don't think SMART was a mistake. So there was already a SMART study. And the original SMART study was a sal salmeterol study uh, comparing using albuterol for rescue versus using salmeterol for rescue. And that study had to be terminated early because kids were dying. I say kids, they were 17 to 26 year olds. Um, the relative risk for death during an exacerbation while using salmeterol was 4.4. So four and a half times the risk of death when using uh, salmeterol over standard therapy. That set, the, that set it back quite a bit as far as seeing if formoterol would work clearly because people were dying. Um, but uh, there were several studies proving the safety of formoterol, and so then they moved ahead with the study using formoterol rather than salmeterol, and hence we end up with our new settings. But um, by calling the new thing smart, it kind of like pushes this off into history, but we should all remember that salmeterol, which is the one in Adver, was killing people when used, um, or was not rescuing them from their exacerbation. It wasn't actively killing them. It wasn't rescuing them from their exacerbation as much as albuterol was. So don't use that here. All we've right, got, so what, go yeah, ahead. I, sorry, we've got two questions that were put in the chat. So, yeah. so what about the use of albuterol for daily exercise induced asthma? Are we going to see, so are there, should we see less of that, that 
type of it's order. I started writing the same question. Are we going to see less of the order of yeah. use before recess or PE? It's a great question. And, and I'll, I'll jump to it. I'm going to get to that a little bit at the end, but I'll jump to that right now. So um, when we meet kids who are having exercise associated symptoms, sometimes we'll switch them to Simbacort because Simbacort has been demonstrated to relieve exercise associated symptoms more than inhaled steroids alone. So the use of Simbacort alone as a control of medication should improve their exercise symptoms, but you can use Simbacort as a, res as a rescue med for exercise, just the same way you use albuterol. And so I'll show you what kind of a sample asthma action plan at the end using okay. smart therapy um, or MART therapy. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But, um, but you'll still see it on some action plans, but you can use Simbacort. You, you may not use albuterol for that, okay. so. And is it the cost of famotorol is compared to albuterol? Yeah, great question. So um, they're both um, obnoxiously expensive, right? <laughs> so when, when that guy that everyone loves to hate was increasing the, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, um, oh, you, you should never hate, when that guy that everyone was, dislikes was increasing the dose of EpiPens and it made national news and he was like raised as a pariah. All his buddies were raising the dose of inhalers. So when I was in training in albuterol inhale, which wasn't that long ago, it was 10 years ago, I started my job up here. Um, albuterol was 150 to $200 inhaler and now it's three to $400 an inhaler. So, um, and the controllers were the same. The controllers were like one to $200. Now they're five to $600 an inhaler. So. Um, that they didn't really change. They just increased the price of everything. Um, so um, the longer answer to what you're saying is, um, I don't know how much an inhaler costs because <laughs> the insurance companies negotiate different prices all the time for them and cover some and don't cover others. Um, on average, uh, if you look it up online, I think Simbacort's running like four to $500 an inhaler and albuterol's like $300 an inhaler. But um, Nobody pays that, really. Um, and and the other thing is, if you're using Simbacort as your only inhaler, you only have one inhaler. If you're using Simbacort and albuterol, you have two inhalers. Right. So that changes the cost calculation a little bit too. Um, anything else I should answer now or? Well, another question and I don't, yeah. you might get to it later too, but this is actually yeah. about albuterol. Why has the use of albuterol gone from two puffs to four puffs, which I've oh, seen great question. in the last year? Yeah, so that's an awesome question. I, I love that question. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of how to formulate this. Um, so there was a study done, uh, and I wish I had the data up on the screen. I can pull the paper up because it's on my desktop, but um, there was a study done comparing the effectiveness of nebulized therapies to um, meter dose inhalers in, in children, because it used to be within the medical group that everyone's like, well, nebulizers are clearly more effective. And so they, they're, they wanted to compare the use of a meter dose inhaler with a spacer and a mask to uh, nebulized therapies in children. And they, had a group of children and half of them they treated with meter dose inhalers, half they treated with nebulizers. The dose of the meter dose inhaler was one puff for every two kilograms up to 20 kilograms. So basically one puff per pound uh, up to 40 pounds, right? Well, no, I got that backwards. One puff for every two kilograms up to 20 kilograms. So a 20 kilogram or 40 pound kids would get 10 puffs, right? So one puff for every four pounds is how I should say. So uh, in that study, nobody had, um, this is getting, I'll get there. I'm just going around the horn here. So in that study, nobody had any cardiac problems. Nobody had any sort of uh, blood pressure issues or anything like that. The only side effect was uh, tachycardia, which isn't a side effect. That's just a sign that you're getting albuterol. Um, and uh, they were breathing better. And so to get that back to four puffs, um, that's a distillation of that study. So a four puffs um, is a uh, eight kilo kid, right? Eight kilos being about 16 and a half, 17 and a half pounds, um, school age kid. Um, so the reason we're doing four puffs is to be the equivalent of a uh, nebulizer. The reason it used to be two puffs is that's an adult thing. And so I, I, I love re ringing the bell of pediatrics that kids aren't adults. Um, and so even, even some of the pharmacies will get pushback when we prescribe four puffs, uh, they'll say that's too much. And we have to send them the study saying, no, this is actually an appropriate dose. Um, and, um, 
but that's that's why you're seeing it. Some of it might be the push from our office, kind of pushing that out there that four puffs is the equivalent of a nebulizer. It's portable. Um, unlike a nebulizer, it's effective and it's not dangerous. So our bigger kids, sometimes we use six puffs, our real big teenagers. But. A lot. What's that? I said, that seems like a lot, but. It, yeah, it's a lot. It is a lot. But I mean, those those are kids that we're seeing in a pulmonary subspecialty office with poorly controlled asthma. So. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so may, maybe not the everyday kid that you're seeing in, in school, but. Any, any other questions? Is that using a spacer? Yes, everybody needs a spacer. Everybody, everybody needs everybody. a spacer all the time. All the time, no questions asked. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll amend that. There is this inhaler. Uh, where'd it go? I have a Q-bar inhaler here somewhere. The new Q-bar is called a ready inhaler. I don't know how many of you see that. And there's a breath actuated albuterol as well, I think now. Dry powder inhalers you don't use spacers for. The breath actuated inhalers are interesting. The reason they don't, I, I was at, a, at one of our national meetings and I went up to the people who make QVAR. The reason they don't recommend using a spacer with QVAR is that you can't generate enough force to trigger the flow. And so, so you don't use a spacer so you can trigger enough force. The problem is, and I asked them like, have you, how fast does it come out of there when you do trigger it? And they said, it's very, it's very similar to the mechanism we have now, uh, meaning the meter dose inhaler before they did away with it. And so um, I asked if they had any studies that um, prove that without an inhaler it's making into their lungs and they said, no. So the reason we use meter dose inhaler is there is a study with me, uh, spacers with meter dose inhalers is there there is a study with meter dose inhalers demonstrating this is the ready inhaler here if you can see it so no spacer and if you drag on it the puff comes out um, that's just sugar it's gross actually but um, <laughs> um, there is a study that if you don't use a spacer with meter dose inhalers, 80% of that medicine ends up in your esophagus and your stomach where it doesn't do anything. Um, so with a spacer, 90% of it will end up in your airway, which is where you want it. And um, that's why we recommend it with everybody. But if, if you have a child with a breath actuated inhaler, they don't need a spacer, but everybody else does. And I would say that children shouldn't have breath actuated inhalers. Um, but that's, that's more of a soapbox thing for me than um, anything else? All right, so what does it look like? And, and we're gonna get a, in a little bit of uh, a gray area here. So the studies uh, show that the controller dose they used for Simbacort was one to two puffs, one to two times daily. So most of what you'll see from us is one puff twice a day. Um, sometimes you'll see one puff once a day of Simbacort uh, or Dulera. And then for rescue, it's one to two puffs as needed. This is the paper. There's no indication of frequency of dosing, no indication of, of how, me, how much you should use, just one to two, um, and it's just as needed. Um, maximum dose recommendation for kids under age 12, so four to 11 years old, is no more than eight puffs a day. Maximum dose recommendation for those kids 12 and older is 12 puffs a day. So it's a lot of freedom to use it, but you can imagine if you're taking two puffs for your controller dose already, that leaves you six puffs for an entire day. It's a little bit of a mental switch to go from like, oh, I can give two puffs of albuterol or four puffs of albuterol every four hours to I can only use one puff of this four more times a day or six more times a day today, right? So that's, it's a little bit of a switch for families to go through. Um, and there really isn't guidance on how, how you should write these action plans. So you'll see them written all different ways. If you go onto some of the big hospital websites, they, they make very strong claims that this is how it should be done. That's not based on data. That's based on just some person, physician there deciding this is how I'm gonna write it. Um, so there really is no, pres no prescribed uh, dosing frequency. Um, and I'll tell you what we do to make it easier for families. Um, but what is known is you shouldn't take more than eight puffs of it a day if you're under age 12 or 12 puffs a day if you're 12 and older, so. Um, so this is what our action plans look like. And, and this was put together with um, your organization, I think, about uh, nine years ago or, uh, or so. It, there was some, a summer meeting where they put this together. And so this is what our action plans look like. 
Uh, I don't use peak flow. No, none of my partners use peak flow. Uh, there's pretty good data that peak flow meters are super unreliable in children. Um, and that's because you have to care what the number is and kids just don't care. <laughs> they, you know, most kids just, if they're not feeling good, they're not going to want to breathe in the machine and show you what their peak flow is. And, and there's nothing you can do about it. You and I would want to know what our peak flows are because we're going to want to know how well we are. But kids, they have nothing to gain from it. And those that do have something to gain from it can make it a lower number so that maybe they see you more often and aren't in my wife's English class. Um, so, um, so we don't use them. We use symptoms and we use, we use coughing, shortness of breath and perceived breathlessness. Um, obviously you can game those as well, but that's what we use. And we really coach kids to use the language that they have. So the younger kids won't say my chest is tight. They'll have some other word for it. And, and we strongly encourage using the kids vocabulary to explain how they feel because that's how they can accurately describe what's going on. Um, and, and, and we actually coach parents to listen to the language the kids are using rather than forcing the kids to use the language we use. So, um, so this, is a, this is like one of the templates I have for an action plan using Simbacort. I filled it out a little bit just so it was simpler. So it's Simbacort 80, one puff once a day. Here's your exercise question. Simbacort 80, one puff 15 minutes prior to exercise. And then when sick, Simbacort 80, one puff every three hours up to seven times a day. So that's eight total puffs, right? This is a made up time. This family that I wrote this for just wanted a time frame. Like, how much can I use it? Some families are fine with me writing, use one puff as needed for symptoms of coughing and shortness of breath. Some families, we tell them, you know, one puff once a day or one puff twice a day, whatever it's doing. And then when they're sick, just give two puffs four times a day. So then they, then they know, okay, four times a day, I'm giving two puffs. This is easy for me to keep track of. It's the keeping track of it that I think families get worried about a little bit because it's, it is a lot of like, oh, did I give, did I give seven or eight or nine? How many did I give today? Um, I also coach them that like nine puffs isn't going to hurt your child. So if you think they need something and you're not sure if you already gave eight, give that ninth puff. It doesn't matter. Um, practically what I've seen happening. Oh, in this last zone here. So as I said, I grew up in Burnham and, and when we grew up in Burnham, is anyone here from that area? I don't want to. I don't want to offend everybody, but we called we called the uh, Sebastian Cook Hospital the Band Aid Station, which is the one in Pittsfield. Um, <laughs> that was. I don't. I, I, my my uh, my cousin's wife is the nurse manager there now. But um, but so we wouldn't drive there from Burnham. We'd drive to Waterville from Burnham. So like a thirty minute drive, right? Um, so I I on for. An albuterol rescue on the way to the hospital, which is somebody's blown through their albuterol doses and they're still working hard to breathe. I mean, blown through their Simbacort doses and they're still working hard to breathe. I tell them to go ahead and use the albuterol because I, I want them to be safe. And so it's four puffs of albuterol every 15 minutes up to three times on the way to the hospital. That's a lot of albuterol, right? So that's a four-year-old kid getting 12 puffs of albuterol on the way to the hospital. The reason I do that, that's the equivalent of three back-to-back -back nebulizers, which is the initial emergency room management of these children. So because I know some kids are driving from 40 minutes away, I want them to be treating them in the car on the way there, not having them get worse on the way there and then being really bad when they get to the hospital. So um, any questions about that? Are you guys seeing Simbacort in, at, to be used in the school yet? I see some nods. Is anyone? We're not seeing it in the school setting yet, but I'm seeing it um, with my own child with his asthma maintenance. We're now using Simbacort more often than the albuterol. We're seeing it in Brunswick. I just got my first dose in Kennebunk for a five-year-old. How's it? So what, I'll tell you how I'm practically seeing kids respond to it, but I'm kind of curious about how you're seeing it go in the school. Cause it's, that's why I reached out to you. Cause I, I, I was talking to my partners. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go in schools. Like, I don't know if families are going to be able to get that extra inhaler because insurance companies actually aren't paying for two inhalers a month. Um, and, and they still refuse to do it, even though these national guidelines have been out for a while. Um, so what I'm seeing is kids, when they get sick, they maybe need two or three more puffs of Simbacort and that's it. They, they're not using all eight puffs. They're not using, not using close to 12 puffs in the older kids. Um, that some of the some of the families that are doing two puffs four times a day, they're using eight puffs. But the ones that are using it as needed, it's like two or three more puffs, and they're doing fine. Um, and 
I haven't had anybody, well, no, that's not true. I've had one, one family fail this. And I think the failure was they weren't as well controlled as I thought they were because it was COVID and they weren't getting sick. And as soon as they started getting viruses, like, like every kid has this past fall, um, they just were way out of control. And we ended up ramping them way up to Simba Court 160, actually, because that kid was pretty poor control. So are you, are you all seeing hangups for the inhalers in the schools? Like the Simba Court. I, I have an inhaler. I have Simba Court for that one child. She just transferred over from Albuterol to Simba Court because she was hospitalized uh -huh. um, quite significantly. Um, for a little while, I kept hearing wheezing and ronchi, and, and she was, they actually had to put on an antibiotic um, because it just wasn't, it wasn't knocking anything out of her. She was just constantly wheezing and suffering. It wasn't controlled at all. Um, and then they finally just put her on Simbacort and took away the albuterol. So she has been doing well in the last couple of weeks. I haven't really had to see her. That's great. I've, I've given the Simbacort. We have a child who has it here, has the extra inhaler here. Um, I don't know if insurance did cover it or not, but it's, um, and I've only had to give it once during the school day and the child was very well controlled. Great, great. Yeah, I, our worry um, when we saw, cause we, we prescribed it initially and, and the first barrier we had were pharmacists um, actually. Cause they told us like, if you prescribe it this way they're gonna go through, you know, 136 puffs in the first two weeks and they're going to not fill their inhaler. And we said, no, 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 it's just, it's just as needed. Like that's, they shouldn't need it more than a day or two. And so we're actually writing our scripts now to say, don't use increased Simicor for longer than five days, just so they'll get filled by pharmacy. Um, and then the second thing we found is that we can't get kids to uh, inhalers. So what we're telling them to do is, you know, at one puff once a day, you're going to go through an inhaler every three or four months, depending on how much you're using as needed. So at the end of the month, even if you don't need one, fill it like, and that's how they're getting their second inhalers. Um, some of them, some of them, but, um, but yeah, it, there's some, there's some real practical sort of healthcare system issues right now that we're kind of navigating. There yeah. wasn't, oops, sorry. Go ahead, Miranda. Um, my, my concern just from, you know, and I'm wondering for when it comes into the school, cause I don't have any kids on Simba court yet here, except for my only child, but my concern is the pharmacy aspect, like you just mentioned. Yeah. Are they going to, because he gets two puffs BID. So on that occasional time, and he's been sick constantly this year, they just put him up to the 160. Yeah. Um, so my question is, are, that is my concern. Are they going to fill it? That's my. So, so, you know, the other thing about the guidelines is, and maybe I'll share my screen again. Um, the other thing about the guidelines is that, um, let me share my screen again. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. All right, the other thing about the guidelines and here are the guidelines. So let's just take the um, five to 11 year olds. So you have this sort of daily and as needed inhaled corticosteroids and basically we'll just say Simicort because it's easier to say daily and as needed Simicort. So this step four is Simicort 160, right? Step five, so if you're, if you're using this all the time, and I would say two puffs twice a day of Simicort, you're kind of here. Uh, daily high dose inhaled corticosteroids and a long acting beta agonist and as needed albuterol. So once you get to that point where you're using like more than one Simicort 160 inhaler a month, you really are at the point where you're using albuterol as a rescue man. Um, and so, you know, that, I mean, when I see a patient and I'm talking to them and, you know, they're telling me they're going through like if they're saying, yeah, I've, I've gone through like a Simbacort inhaler plus this month, I'm kind of questioning like, ooh, I think I need to ramp up their therapy a little bit because this is not, this isn't how I was envisioning this going. And, and um, that child I told you that failed the therapy for me, that's what happened with them is they, they, got, they got all these illnesses that are flying all over the place. And they called us and they said, look, we've been through our Simbacort inhaler. And I said, okay, well, time to step it up. Let's change things around. And we stepped it up right away over the phone. But, um, but you're right, that is the concern is that they won't have the meds. And um, obviously our, our office works with our patients. Like if, if there's an emergency need for an inhaler, we'll, 
jump through all the hoops to get the one, but. Um. The other question that had been in the chat was about um, spacers and how some insurance companies don't cover I know. The spacer, is there, do you know of any secret ways to get free ones? Refer them to pulmonary. We hand them out. <laughs> That's not going to work for the whole state. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy that it's not part of the, part of the, not only don't they cover them, but they cost like a hundred dollars and, and um, they're definitely not a sophisticated machine. Um, so I don't, we don't have a secret way of getting them. We hand them out when we see kids uh, because we know that that's what happens is they don't cover the spacers. I, I don't, I wish I had a better answer than that. Maybe it's time for some main legislation. I don't know. But. If, or, do you have to have a prescription to get a spacer? We write them. Uh, I, I think was just I wondering if, if schools well, had extra money that they, oh, you know, because wow. schools are just rolling in money all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> but could, could they stock a few extras? That's a great this? idea. I don't, I mean, we need to write a prescription for somebody to have a spacer for them to get it handed to them. But I don't know. That's a great question. And that, that would be an awesome intervention, actually to have at a school is spacers. Um, especially if a kid brings you his rescue med and he doesn't have a spacer with it. Because like, so often they don't bring a yeah, spacer. Yeah, that's it. I'd be happy to join any sort of advocacy to get that to be a thing. Are spacers dishwasher safe? No, okay. no. So um, I do have one of those sitting here. So this is one without a mask, right? Uh, sorry, this is one without a mask. And so we just tell people to take it apart. So this part comes off and then this part you can twist off and I don't want to break it while I'm here, but you can pop it off with a spoon or something. Here it comes. Anyways, we tell people to use like just Dawn dish soap and wash them off and let them dry. Um, don't towel dry them because you don't want any fibers in there. Um, we also tell people, does this one have the whistle on it? It does. Let's see if it'll work. Um, we also remind people that they need to breathe slowly through the mouthpiece spacer, not quickly, um, which is why I don't like meter, uh, why I don't like dry powder inhalers. Dry powder inhalers, you have to breathe fast through them. Um, and that's the opposite of what you do with a spacer and a albuterol. So if I'm breathing through this, I'm gonna dose myself with the sugar water again, but if I'm breathing through this slowly, um, no squeak, if I breathe through it fast, I get that squeak and they shouldn't hear it squeak. And some, some kids we see coming in and they're saying, it squeaks every time I use it and they're so proud and I have to shoot them down a little bit. And I wish we had kazoos to hand out to them and tell them that's what should squeak, not your spacer, but um, we don't. In the, in the chat, we've had a couple of people say you can buy them on Amazon. You can buy Great. spacers on Amazon. I would highly advocate that. They're probably, they're probably like a 10th of the price on Amazon too. Thank you. I'm happy to go through the chat too and answer things, but um, I can show you the rest of the guidelines if you want. They're all kind of the same. I mean, you're going to see more younger kids. Again, you guys don't take care of these kids. More younger kids are using long acting and beta agonists. This, that was a change like under age four before it wasn't in the guidelines to use these uh, Symbacort on these kids. Uh, we were doing it as subspecialists, but it wasn't in the guidelines, and the new guidelines have it in there. Um, there's this new um, uh, endorsement of using as-needed inhaled steroids in the younger kids. Um, so these are kids that have infrequent exacerbations only with viral infections, and so as soon as they get a cold, they start like a five-day course of inhaled steroids and the albuterol. Um, that's new. The reason they didn't do this before, and it's still an issue, is if you take, it's associated with shorter kids. Uh, so if you're using fluticasone at higher doses as an as-needed inhaled steroids, so that's that's Flovin, um, those kids have, uh, they're about three centimeters shorter at the end of a year. Uh, oh, then they're like on average. Um, so it's, it's um, I don't like it, but, uh, but it's in the guidelines now. You can use budesonide and, and they won't be, there's no growth inhibition from using budesonide, which is Pomacort nebulized. Uh, but, um, and then, the only other big change in the guidelines, the biggest one was the as needed 
inhaled steroid is in the 12 year olds, this new, um, this new teotropium, um, which is like a controller med only for the sickest kids. Um, and, and it's a, it's an inhaler. It's kind of cool actually. Um, it's a muscarinic antagonist, but um, it's kind of cool because it's a mist. And I wish more of these were like this. So no spacer. And I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it, but you see how the mist just kind of comes out. It's really soft. It's not threatening, um, but it's only for older kids. So any other questions? Nope, that's it for now. Great. Um, well, thanks for having me. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations besides Albuterol for students who are struggling with steroid inhalers due to vocal hoarseness? Oh, good question. You know, I've seen vocal hoarseness mostly with the dry powder inhalers, and I don't know if that rings true with the students you're talking about. Um, Montelukast is one. Uh, you know, you can use Singular. Um, there are some behavioral side effects from Singular that are rare but real in some kids. And there's a warning on it now for increased suicidality. I have to say, I've never seen increased suicidality. I've seen the behavioral things. The way I describe it is, and you can measure the disruption of their sleep on a sleep study. Um, so imagine yourself if you haven't had a good night's sleep and how sort of snippy and emotional you are and you have higher highs and lower lows. That's what it does to you. Um, but um, was it, there's that. Um, that's where the long-acting beta agonists come in too. So if somebody's having some hoarseness with inhaled steroids, uh, sometimes you can just switch class of inhaled steroids. So go from buticasone to, um, to beta-methasone or, or go from Flovent to Simicort or to Dulera, which is Mometazone. Um, and th that can kind of relieve some of the hoarseness uh, from those inhalers. Um, or make sure they're using a spacer too. That's the other thing um, to make sure they're using a spacer. Um, depending on their age, make sure the hoarseness isn't thrush because uh, if you're using a, an inhaler, especially if you're using it without a spacer, uh, you're at higher risk for oral pharyngeal thrush and that could be the source of the hoarseness. So those are all the things I would recommend. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? I'd have one, I'd have one comment for you all. And, and um, as I said, my wife's a teacher at a high school. Um, and I would say that if, if you have a child's asthma that's really interfering with school, or if you keep hearing that like they're up all night coughing and their asthma is so bad, so they aren't doing well in school or can't stay awake, or that's why they're in the nurse's office, uh, they don't need to be that way. <laughs> like asthma meds are really good and we can really get great control of even really fragile asthmatics. So I don't know how much advocating power you guys have with families at their, you know, med meetings and all of that, but um, I would, you know, there are asthma specialists in the state where we are, we are among them uh, and we can definitely get better control of the kids. And if, if you could empower the parents to sort of ask for that, um, we, we're happy to help. One last question. Do you find that in teens that they don't want to use the spacers because they don't fit in their pocket? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Totally. Well, that's another benefit of, of some of these more, some of these less frequent treatments, right? So if you're not, if you're, if you're not using a butyrol for a rescue and you're using Simbacor, I mean, I guess they don't want it in their pockets because they don't want to do it. But yes, totally. That's, that's totally it. It's not cool, right? So not cool. No, we just no. We just need like Ryan Reynolds to walk around with an inhaler and a spacer or something. Well, somebody needs to call him. Call yeah, somebody yeah. that's famous that has <laughs> asthma. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us. I think that one of the questions that I will get is, are you willing to share your presentation, your slides? Yes, um, absolutely. And you can just email those to Tammy. And do the disposable, little disposable cardboard spacers actually work if you don't have a real one? I, I would say they're better than nothing. Better than nothing, all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I coached somebody to use a, um, uh, a plastic bottle once. 
Mm-hmm. This was this was in fellowship. Um, they were having trouble. They said, I, I, I think he'll be okay if I get the albuterol in him, but, we, but my spacer broke or something like that. And so we use a plastic bottle to make one. Totally off-label, not FDA approved. But um, what, all, all, the function of the spacer is just to suspend the medicine so that when you breathe in, you're drawing it down into your lungs rather than having the medicine spray in the back of your throat. That's, that's the only thing it's for. Um, yeah. Younger kids use the mask because they can't time the breath appropriately or can't take a slow enough breath. So they use the mask and the spacer so that, so that when they're breathing, they're just breathing back and forth the medicine that's in here until it's diluted. But um, anything that you could suspend the medicine in would be great. Paper obviously is a little more absorbent than plastic, um, but, um, but it's better than nothing, I would say. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. I, I enjoyed this and uh, feel free if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them in the future too. So Great. I'm going to stop recording.